All right. What is up, fantasy land? Time for another edition of the Goat District Podcast. District, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing on all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash off is the best. You try to make it complex. Then they text you back. Now, all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. Trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be traded. And I always be traded. And I always be traded. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them. Fish. All right. Welcome, Fantasy Land. We have a great guest for you tonight. You're going to really love t- tonight's episode. And before we start anything, make sure you smash the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the Goat District. Uh, help us out. Help us help you out. The, the more uh, the more people we get watching, the more uh, clicks we get, the easier it is to keep this thing going. So tap the bell. Make sure you don't miss an episode. And get yourself subscribed if you're not. So tonight, we've got a great guest on, which we're going to introduce in a minute. But first, I want to bring on my partner, Theo. Welcome to the GOAT District, Theo. What's going on, Dan? How are we doing tonight, man? Doing great. Unfortunately, uh, our our fearless leader, JD, is not going to be able to be with us tonight. Uh, He's a little bit under the weather, so... Uh, we're giving him the night off. We're gonna we're gonna let him uh, try to recover, and uh, you and I are gonna take this thing and uh, you know bring a little bit of that Vegas energy to it. Uh, I, I still got a little bit of that pumping through my veins. So how about you? No, absolutely. It's uh, J- JD's on the short term IR. I don't want anybody to worry. It's short term, <laughs> short term injury. Uh, you know he's he's more more Darrell Henderson and Jarvis Landry at this point. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. I always enjoy talking with uh, Dan. We've got a great de- guest tonight. Um, I'm in, I'm in waiver wire hell right now. I'm trying to get all my, all my bits in for, for many leagues tonight. So I don't have to scramble tomorrow. So this is a nice break from that. Um, I feel like I've been doing calculus for about the last hour and my brain is fried. So I'm happy to just talk some football with my man, Dan. Yeah, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, like uh, leaning over and checking out your your notes and your crib sheet, and because yeah, I've still got to do all mine tomorrow. So it is. <laughs> it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting week. I'm sure we'll touch on it tonight. It's not as uh, it's not like the one big Elijah Mitchell name, but there's there's a lot of names. So uh, I'm sure we'll touch on some of those with uh, with our great guest tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that guest, this is uh, this is one of my favorite up and coming fantasy analysts. I, I think uh, you know he, he's really doing great things in the industry. Uh, he's putting out some great content. Uh, if you're looking for your tight end whisperer, you need go no farther uh, than the man we're about to bring in. It's the one and only Koopa Fiasco, uh, Andrew Cooper. Welcome. How you doing? Hey, what's up, fellas? Thanks for having me on, man. And thanks for that uh, that intro there, dude. And, and the intro that you guys have to your show, I got to say, is the best one on any show. I mean, do you guys hear that often, that people saying that, that this intro is like, it gets without a doubt. Oh, it does. It's we do. unbelievable, dude. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's, and it's and hat tip to uh, FF Man Bun, who uh, put that together for us. I, he does the best intros, uh, without a doubt. And uh, so... I, if if you're looking for something like that for a podcast, he's the guy you want to go to, and uh, you know we we love the work that he's done for us. He's he's put together a, three of ours, so uh, we appreciate all of those. Yeah, so good, man. I got I got goosebumps from that. One, man. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, no doubt, love it. So uh, before we get into tonight's topics, and we're going to talk about a few things, we're going to talk, we're going to go through some NFL headlines. We're going to talk a little bit about tight ends since we have our tight end whisperer 
with us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about productive passing trees in the NFL and, uh, you know, which which offenses are working. And uh, then a little bit on running backs, too, the ones that are on the rise versus the ones that are going into dust. Uh, but let's uh, let's first talk for a minute with Coop and uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know what you do outside of fantasy football, uh, how you got into it. Um, anything else you want to cover with that and, uh, you know, kind of how you got into uh, doing analysis with uh, fantasy alarm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, so I went to school for uh, finance and ac- finance and accounting. Uh, graduated uh, about a decade ago. Uh, came out of the, came out of that. Got right into real estate, which uh, is what you know my father worked in. I did mortgages for a while. Did appraisals, um, and kind of doing appraisals is where I really you know started changing the way that I looked at analytics and things you know because like you know i really got into excel really got into different things like that uh and then since then i've moved into commercial acquisitions um you know i've been lucky enough that uh i've been doing the fantasy stuff on the side and i was able to um find fantasy alarm through john and pemba a friend of mine in the industry and uh, i was able to kind of keep my other job while also kind of still having like a semi full-time job doing this over at fantasy alarm so it's worked out pretty well and uh you know I've loved fantasy for about 20 years now and, but probably only been seriously writing for the last five and just kind of really, you know, last couple of years took off a bit, but uh, I love it, man. And, you know, I met, I met Dan through uh, the Scott fishbowl, right? Like, yes. So it's like, it's just crazy how you get in this industry and then all of a sudden you're doing these tournaments and, and you meet all these different people and, you know, you connect with people and you, you make, you make real friends doing this. It's, it's awesome. Really? So. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it, it, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, it was one of the, you were one of those people I really hit it off with in that chat, which is, and the funny thing is that chat is still going, um, you know, more than a year later. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we've all moved on to the next fishbowl, but the, uh, the previous fishbowl, there's still like, uh, you know, I don't know, but dozen or so of us that are, you know, right. I talked still- more in that one than this year's. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, this, that's our gang, you know? <laughs> yep, exactly. So yeah, and th- yeah. And this saw. Uh, this time of year, you end up talking to your fantasy football friends more than your real life friends. I mean, every single day, every single day, I talk to Dan and JD about something fantasy football related. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a, it is a real grind this time of year. Yeah. I mean, I just, I was telling you guys, I was away all weekend on a bachelor party. And then, you know, I just watched a half hour show with my girlfriend after she got back from work. And now I'm here with you guys for an hour. So you could get more time than the girl at home, man. There <laughs> you go. The it goes. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, for sure, man. Yep, absolutely. So uh, before we get started, let's just, uh, let's talk real quick about one of our favorite sites to play on uh, over at myffpc.com. Uh, it, it's, the FFPC has every kind of contest you can imagine. Uh, no doubt you are playing them now. Uh, if you're not, shame on you. Uh, you missed the boat and you need to get signed up for next year. Um, but they have, uh, you know, we, we've we got uh, best ball contests. We've got standalone best ball leagues. We've got the, the F football guys contest. We've got the main event. We've got dynasty leagues. You name it. It's out there. There's even standalone auction leagues. I have two auction leagues that I drafted in Vegas that uh, that are going right now. So you, anything you want out there, you can find it on my fantasy league or uh, my FFPC. And make sure that uh, you are you're getting yourself signed up, ready to go. If you've never done it before, make sure you check in with uh, Theo or myself or JD. Uh, just send us a DM, slide into those DMs and let us know, hey, I'd like to, to get hooked up with uh, myffpc.com for next year. And uh, we'll we'll set you up with a little bonus. So we'll get you on there and uh, and, and show you a good time. All right. So let's uh, let's get into it. Let's uh, let's jump into the headlines real quick and just kind of uh, talk about a few things that have kind of come to light over the past couple days since uh, week two ended or during week two. Uh, first one is the quarterback situation in Chicago. What do you guys think about uh, Justin Fields starting? Is it something that excites you? Do you think uh, he's going to be in over his head? Where are we at on that? What do you, what do you say, Coop? I mean, for for me, I'm excited for the – like. so anytime I get a mobile quarterback, I'm excited for the quarterback himself a lot more than I am for the rest of the players. Uh, you know, it's like the Konami code, right? Anytime you have those – Four point passing leagues. You want to be grabbing these guys, spending the fab on them. Um, the one thing that I'm not quite excited for about it is that 
Uh, it's kind of been proven mathematically. Uh, you know, the eye test has shown us for a long time that mobile QBs don't really love to dump it down, right, to the running backs. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now we have the mathematical numbers to back that up to a certain degree. Um, you know, so it could be a little bit of a hit to David Montgomery. Could also be a little hit to uh, Cole Komet, who runs kind of a, you know, five-yard, six-yard A dot. Uh, but I think it's going to, you know, the mobile QBs that can extend plays end up being, you know, big for themselves and also big for guys like Darnell Mooney, who can, you know – when the play gets extended and you got a speedy guy that can get an open space, you've seen what happens with like Tyler Lockett and, uh, you know, Tyree kill and just can pull those massive plays. So, you know, it, it's going to be interesting. You know, what do you think, Theo? Oh, I'm, I'm fired up for Justin Fields. Um, he's a player that I have rostered a lot of. Um, I think he's, he's the kind of guy that will have a side um, with his rushing ability. And I think he's an underrated passer. I think once he gets, once he gets his feet set, um, and as a week to prepare as the starter, um, I think you'll see him him look improved as a passer, um, you know, from from where we saw him the, the first two games. Um, and like you said, I think that it's uh, usually these rookie quarterbacks have tunnel vision for for one receiver. But I'm hopeful that it will keep Mooney afloat. Mooney's been kind of a, a guy who I've been impressed with so far. But um, I think if you're if if you have Allen Robinson, um, you know, to me, it's it's an upgrade for him as well. Um, you know, Dalton was not very good. So I'm, I'm bullish on fields. Um, and I actually have some interesting lineup decisions on like my fields teams. Like, do I start, you know, Joe Burrow or Justin Fields? I think I'm going to throw Justin Fields right out there. Um, Andrew Schellenberg, another, another GOAT district member, and I have a team where we've been streaming quarterbacks until Fields or Lance was ready to go. And that's over. I think we're throwing Fields in there. So I think that uh, I have a very optimistic um optimistic feeling about fields and i think he'll shine and i think it's also great that he gets to start in his you know the state he had so much success in in college it's kind of a great story to see him go and and get that first start in cleveland yeah absolutely and uh you know as as somebody who has drafted fields as a second quarterback everywhere or in some cases even my first quarterback and then you know trying to go out and grab a guy like uh you know um Ryan Fitzpatrick or um, even David Carr, Tua Tagovailoa, a couple of those haven't worked out quite so well. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I had one team I, I started uh, Fitzpatrick the first week and uh, Tua the second week. So uh, that, that that team is uh, sputtering badly due to no yeah. quarterback points. But other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to getting Fields in there. Now, if I've got Brady and Fields, I'm, I'm leaving Brady. And, you know, if you've got uh, Lamar Jackson and Fields, you're leaving Lamar Jackson in there. But, uh, you know, if you've been kind of skimping along at quarterback, Fields is the way to go, I think. Yeah, interesting you bring up, Theo, the, uh, that he's playing uh, He's playing that kind of the home game there because I've been looking at some of the TV maps, and it's crazy how, like, you look at week one, uh, the entire state of Utah, they, they were showing the, um, the Jets and Panthers game just because of Zach Wilson. So can you imagine the ratings this week? With uh, Fields playing at home like that, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be spicy. It's gonna be a tough one for a lot of Browns fans who uh, right. you know are, are also Buckeyes fans. It's gonna be um, you know really tough to see them uh, you know their reaction. But yeah, it's it's a it's a great it's a great storyline. I mean, I personally would like to have seen him get the start this week against Cincinnati, so he had his feet wet. But you know that's just not the way Matt Nagy did it, and we'll see this week how it goes. I just I hate that Nagy said. Um, that Dalton is still the quarterback when he comes back. I mean, it's like, why even say that? Why, why, why not just say we'll, we'll assess it as we go, you know? I, I mean, we, we could, we could spend a whole podcast criticizing Matt Nagy. <laughs> I think it's because he's, I think I, I, my theory is it's the weak coaches always kind of want to defer to the veterans and they want to, you know, pay homage to them. And, you know, he should have just gone with fields from the start. Um, we all saw how that Rams game went, um, you know, they got the win last week against the Bengals, but it certainly wasn't because of Andy Dalton. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see now. But maybe Justin Fields is going to save Matt Nagy's job this year. We'll, we'll see. Hmm. I, I think he's pretty much got to put him in if he wants to keep his job. Uh, put him in and leave him in for sure. All right. How about out in Cleveland? Uh, we got some injury issues with the wide receivers there, right? Uh, we've got Jarvis Landry just hit the disabled list today. Uh, rumors of... Odo Beckham coming back in, uh, maybe making his debut this week. Uh, 
Cooper, you invested in uh, the Cleveland wide receivers at all? And if so, what are you doing with this mess? So I have some Odell, right? Um, and I think that, so I've been, I do the snap count stuff. I've been really looking at it uh, over at Fantasy Alarm. It seemed like what happened was um, they wanted to basically use Odell and Jarvis and then Risha, uh, sorry, and then um, Anthony Schwartz, the rookie, is like a field stretcher, right? He's got an A dot that's like over 20 yards right now, like 23. What happened? was basically when Odell was out, it looked like they brought in Donovan People Jones to play that full snap share, right? The weird thing is that when Rashard Higgins I uh, sorry, when um Jarvis got hurt, all of a sudden it was Rashard Higgins that came in, not Anthony Schwartz. His snaps didn't really change. So I'll be interested to see if maybe what happens is Peoples Jones ends up being the odd man out now. Because he hasn't really been producing. He's kind of playing that split end role. I think it might I think Rashad Higgins might be the one that picks up a additional role here. I mean, it's kind of a way off the radar guy, but just looking at how they util- utilize the guys after Jarvis got hurt, you know, it, it seems like he, it was kind of the understudy for that slot role. I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you, do you have any uh, interest in any of these guys? I like the take on, on Hollywood Higgins. That's, that's Baker's boy. Like he, he loves, he loves Higgins. Um, And that's one of the reasons Higgins stayed in Cleveland was because of his connection with Baker He's like a company guy, um, but you know I'd probably be avoiding all the all the wide receivers um, except for Odell. I think if Odell is this week, um, you know it's it's it would be classic Odell to step into a, a big target share. And I think you use the draft capital. You took him in the sixth round. Um, you know some people were taking him in the fifth round, but if you took him in the sixth round, you took him in the seventh round, and he comes back, use him until he gets hurt again. Um, and then I, I'm I'm intrigued by Schwartz. Uh, Dan and JD in our in our dynasty league that we're in made a made a big uh, bid on Schwartz. Um, you know he looks like a guy who's going to have an impact in this league. I just think it's it's a tough guy to to predict week to week, and he's a very young player. I think he's only like twenty. Um, man, he can fly. So they really need Odell. I think if it's if Odell does not play this week, I think it could be in a little trouble offensively. Um, you know, I'd be looking at potentially stream like Austin Hooper. It might be not be a bad spot for him, but if Odell doesn't play, I'd, I'd be avoiding all Browns wide receivers. How about you, Dan? Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same boat. Um, you know, it, there's, I don't have a lot of Odell, but um, where I do, I've got one team where I could definitely use him, And then I have another team where I'm actually strong enough at wide receiver that I'm still uh, considering whether I should just maybe sit him and, uh, you know, wait for that, uh, you know, prove it week and, and see what happens. But I, most of the time you're probably going to, you know, you're going to be in a situation where if you've got him, you probably got to start him, um, especially with some of the, you know, the injuries that have already been starting to happen in the wide receivers around the NFL. So, and um, yeah, definitely love the take on uh, Schwartz. I'm, I'm big on getting him on dynasty leagues. I've got him on several, uh, you know, and the time to act is, you know, kind of already passed, but uh you know, if you're if your league is a little slow on the uptake and he's still out there, uh, make sure you grab him. And uh, you know, it it doesn't hurt to make an offer for him after he kind of did. He put up a complete donut this past week. He did, didn't he? I believe so. I believe he did not have a catch this week. Okay, yeah. So you know, that might be a good time. You know, if if he is owned to uh, just go out there and uh, you know make an offer to that owner. You know, just uh, get that you know that little fourth round pick or uh, you know. Just throw him a little something and uh, see if you can get yourself some shorts. Hmm. All right, let's move on to Arizona, where we had uh, we had the coming out party for Rondale Moore, right? Uh, you know, all of a sudden he just exploded against the the Vikings. Uh, but kind of interestingly enough, it was on still, you know, he wasn't out there as much as some of the other receivers, and you know, so he was doing a lot with not quite as much time out on the field. Um, Andrew, how do you, how do you feel about that? And um, you know, what are you, what are you doing with Rondale Moore? Is he somebody you're just throwing into the starting lineups and saying, yeah, he's arrived or are you still being a little cautious with him? I'm still being a little cautious. I mean, if you look at the, the first, so the first week he basically had uh, three screen passes and then one play that was a completely broken play, you know, it was scrambling around mm-hmm. for, 15 seconds before he got it. Um, and then last week, if you look at the big play he made, it was once again kind of a broken play. Uh, I still think Rondell Moore has the biggest upside out of all these guys. Um, but the reality is that he's a smaller guy. On the very first week, he only played six 
plays where he was asked to run block. And on one of them, he, you know, just blatantly couldn't handle his guy. So he just held him, you know, got called for holding. I, so I think that's what's holding back his snap share. But I think they're just going to keep manufacturing this guy touches. And in the end, it's just going to end up being like one of those, um, maybe not a full on Tyreek kill situation, but they're going to eventually look at it and say, why are we giving so many snaps to AJ Green? You know, why are we giving so many snaps to, uh, why are we lining up Chase Edmonds at wide receiver so often? You know what I mean? When we have this guy who is just so explosive. So I'm in wait and see mode. You definitely want to add him where you can. Um, It's just, I need to see him. I'd love to see him do more, just lining up as a wide receiver and beating his man in man to man, because we haven't really seen a ton of that. We've seen broken plays and screens and stuff, but I'd love to see him, you know, really transition into, um, you know, that real wide receiver, you know? Yep, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm all, I'm all in on Rondell Moore. Um, I think that the way that you kind of view him um, in a start sit situation is you assess your roster. If, if you're feeling super strong about, about your matchup um, and you can go with more of a, of a floor play at flex, that's fine for certain teams. But if, if you're in a, if you're in a situation where you need a guy who is a boom bust type guy, um, I think you go with Rondell Moore. Um, the, the usage might be um, a little annoying week to week, but you've seen what you can do in a boom week this past week. I, it's really hard for them to put that away um, after, after he flashed. Um, he, he makes so many smart plays. The, the, the play where they had the long, long 60 plus yard goal, it was Rondell Moore getting out of bounds. Um, doing everything he could to to evade, um, you know, tacklers and then getting out of bounds, really stretching it. He has such a presence. Um, and I think that he also, they, they showed what they want to do where they had the the one manufactured rushing attempt where he almost got in the end zone. It was, it was an unfortunate fumble. Um, but they they're, they're clearly want to get him uh, the ball. And he does lead the team in targets per route run. So when he's on the field, they're getting him the ball or they're at least looking to get him the ball. So um, he, he's the kind of guy that, that you want to do everything you can to get in Dynasty. Um, he's almost impossible to get right now in Dynasty. I've, I've tried this week a few, a few trades, but um, in redraft, I'm, I'm bullish on him as well. How about you, Dan? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, pretty bullish on him. I'm kind of, you know, I'm where Coop is. I'm, I'm still being a little bit cautious as to where I'm sticking him in. Uh, but, you know, it, he's a guy that I kind of drafted to be a second half of the season guy and the fact that he's already starting to pop just makes me feel good about uh you know making that decision and uh you know i'll throw him in where i need him and uh places where i i feel pretty good i'm just gonna leave him on the bench and and uh let him continue to mature and hopefully continue to uh start picking up more and more snaps and uh you know as coop was saying get out there and run some real routes um and you know with with rondell moore i think you're gonna want to um, you know, grab him if he, you know, if he has a bad couple of games and, and somebody drops him or, you know, you could pick him up in dynasty league because, uh, you know, his owner's starting to get sour on him, you know, that's the time to do it. Probably not going to, uh, happen, but, uh, you know, maybe he'll get lucky. I mean, you know, sometimes people drop some pretty crazy players, you know, just because they get into a bye week pinch. So it, it, it could definitely happen. Um, what do you guys think about uh, switching gears, uh, going over to the Jaguars? Um, how are you guys approaching this team, given that it, you know, they really haven't seemed to be able to get it all together? Uh, you know, they've just been struggling. Uh, you know, it, it, it looks like the, you know, there's a little bit of problems with scheme. Uh, I'm not sure if the coaches are quite wired into the NFL. Um, how they're handling their players? What 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 kind of takes are you getting on the uh, the Jags? And we'll we'll start with you on this one. Um, I'll give a shout out to, to Dwayne McFarland. But one thing that stuck out to me in his article this week, which is great on PFF, um, is that they're dead last in time of possession. I mean, they've got major problems in Jacksonville. Um, I think that this week is a is a big test for James Robinson. Um, if you're He's a he's really a difficult player um, to use right now, but um, you know against a against a team that should really really um, you know beat the shit out of him in Arizona. Um, you know I think James Robinson does have a chance to at least uh, catch some balls this week, but I, I'm really going to try not to, not to start James Robinson on any team that I have him um, until I see something. I think the one kind of bright spot is is Marvin Jones. 
Um, he had 11 targets last week. Um, and, you know, they seem to be leaning on him. Uh, Lawrence seems to like him. Uh, DJ Shark had the big week one. Um, so I, it's, it's a really frustrating team. I kind of wish I had no Jaguars. Um, and I wouldn't have to have to deal with it at any time during the weeks, but it's uh, it's one of the worst teams in the league, and and clearly one of the worst teams in the league. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I mean, one of the big I'm a big tight end guy. I really didn't understand the usage for James O'Shaughnessy. Did you guys see those numbers? He, he was using like it was Travis Kelsey. He right, was, exactly. Uh, it was uh, pretty ridiculous, man. So, I mean, I look at it now though, and I say, okay, you know what? O'Shaughnessy's hurt. Lavisca Schnault's hurt. Now you kind of have consolidated snap chairs among DJ Chark and Marvin Jones. I'm basically saying I'm using these guys in emergencies only. Like, so I'm not even, there's probably no situations where I'm starting James Robinson in the flex, but if I, if I know when that RB two, then he, he'll have to be there. You know what I mean? Like usually I'll have a wide receiver or somebody else I can start over him in the flex. Same thing with these wide receivers where it's like, if I can avoid it, then I will, especially, you know, with a bad matchup. But I mean, Arizona secondary isn't necessarily amazing. And if I have no other options, then I'm willing to use a Marvin Jones or a DJ chart. But, you know, like you said, I'd rather not have them. And they're kind of got, but they're not guys you can drop. You know, they're kind of in case of emergency, break the glass type guys for me. Trevor Lawrence, you just can't touch him right now while he's on pace to break Peyton Manning's rookie interception record, you know? So it's like, um, you know, you just have to hope that somewhere in there, Urban Meyer has, you know, set the, the wheels in motion and it's all going to click at some point. Sometimes that does happen, but you know, it, it could just get more and more ugly. So, you know, we'll say, Dan, what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, I, I kind of feel like in Jacksonville right now, it's uh, there, you know, he's trying to mash the players into the scheme instead of make the scheme fit the players. And, you know, that tends to be a real problem. And when I see that, I'm, you know, I try to shy away from that as far as, as far as I can. Uh, I do have a lot of LaVisca Chenault, Unfortunately, uh, for this year, uh, you know, I think in Dynasty will probably end up being all right. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely disappointing to see how things have gotten off to this rocky start. And, uh, you know, Trevor Lawrence making the, the transition, it's been a little bit tough. Uh, you know, I was never one of those people who thought Trevor Lawrence was, uh, you know, this, the next coming of Peyton Manning or anything like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought he was great, quite great prospect but um you know not like a generational prospect or anything i think he was just you know he was definitely the best of this class and uh you know as as far as prospects go but you know even as we've seen in the past uh you know it's not always the best prospects that end up making the best nfl quarterbacks uh, you know if you if you talk to josh allen he can probably tell you a little bit about that <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know buffalo saw something in him but uh not many other people did so Brett, yeah. Brett Favre, Brett Favre was another one who terrible completion percentage and he oh, was not, yeah. not a good college quarterback. And the Falcons traded him like right away, you know. It's like, but he turned out to be great. And on the other hand, um, when you go back and look at you know the best, highest graded prospects of all time, like Ryan Leaf is right there. There was no reason not to believe that Ryan Leaf wouldn't be a good NFL quarterback, you know. And it's just like he just didn't have it, you know. So it, it's always at, at a position that's so cerebral, you yeah. never know, really, you know. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean, it's just so it's so hard to see how they're going to make that jump uh, to the NFL. And you know, I I'm definitely if if I've got Marvin Jones, I'm starting him. Uh, he's been working for the past couple of weeks. Uh, I think Lawrence is you know at least has confidence in him that he's going to keep throwing him the ball. And as long as he keeps getting those targets, uh, I'm good with that. So I'll I'll use him. Uh, the rest I'm trading pretty lightly on though. All right, and then uh, let's let's talk a little bit about David Carr. I mean, here's a guy who's uh, you know he's been in the league since what 2014, I believe. Uh, you know, and we've spent most of his career kind of crapping on him a little bit. Uh, you know, it it it, it just kind of seemed like he was one of those. You know, I I kind of put him in that Andy Dalton range. Um, you know, he was just good enough to keep you from moving on to a quarterback who might be able to win you something, uh, you know, and and still on an NFL level, I don't know if he's there or not. But, um, you know, when we're looking at at uh, him from a fantasy standpoint, um, I'm put, putting up a screen here. 
this is David Carr last year and the first two games of this year. And you can see, um, you know, as we as we look at uh, the last, you know, what is it, eight, nine, nine games or so? I mean, he's been crushing it uh, fantasy wise. Do you guys think that's something that can continue as Gruden finally got him into a good system and, uh, you know, he's got the targets that he needs to make this happen? Or is this just, a, you know, a nice little run that's going to probably end pretty soon? Uh, and uh, Coop, why don't you start with that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always kind of thought Derek Carr was a good quarterback in the sense of like a game management. Like he's not really mm-hmm. a guy that loses games. He's always had a good completion percentage. He, that's why he was for a little while now. He's been the uh, Scott Fishbowl cheat code. Where, you know, it, where there's um, yeah, you get points for completions, you lose points for incompletions. Uh, kind of a little industry secret guy. And I think that make, maybe that's why I'm a little bit partial to him. But uh, I th- I'm thinking that you know a lot of the recent production has kind of been a part of them uh, dismantling this run game. You know, it's like Josh Jacobs was hurt at the end of last year. Uh, you know, they lose Trent Brown. They trade their center away. Now Jacobs is, hurt, is banged up again. Um, you know, it's just kind of a situation where some teams, if you're, you know, trying to be a defensive pound-the-ball team, you're not going to have a quarterback that's throwing for a lot of yards. And as soon as that's off the table – now you don't really have a lot of choice. I mean, you think about that game where you threw it to Waller 19 times. They didn't have much choice but to throw it to Waller 19 times. You know, I was trying to think of other ways they could handle things, but there was just nothing else there. So it's like you got to take what's given to you sometimes, you know. And uh, that's why fantasy is so hard because it's like you want these matchups where it's good offense, bad defense, and it's just a tough balance, you know. But uh, I, I could see Carr uh, sticking to it. I mean, Ruggs take a little step forward. Uh, Kenny and Drake catch the ball. I don't know. What do you think, Theo? I'm, I'm actually very bullish on the situation in Las Vegas. Um, they have they have two win, wins over teams that were in the playoffs last year. Um, I think that, that really speaks volumes. I thought that it was a very emotional win um, against Baltimore to start the year, and they carried that momentum into Pittsburgh. Um, I think that the fans in Vegas, are, it's a really good situation playing in Vegas. Um, and I think that uh, Carr has, has started out red hot. Um, the, we bring up Waller, who's, you know, a fantastic weapon. Um, but I, I kind of like the wide receiver core he has. I think he's, he's getting the most out of them. Um, you know, Renfro seems to be guy he likes, um, you know, we all like Brian Edwards on the goat district and, uh, rugs really flashed last game and he found Foster Moreau on a touchdown as well against Pittsburgh. So he's using his weapons. Well, I agree with Coop that, uh, Drake was a really nice addition, um, so I'm I'm kind of bullish, and he's got over 800 yards passing right now. I don't think any other quarterbacks at 700. Um, so I think this this will keep going, um, and I think they'll get the win this week against Miami, and then you know there's potential for for shootouts in that division. Um, you know the the games against Los Angeles uh, and Kansas City. Um, you know those seem like shootout types games. So I'm buying I'm buying Carr as you know a borderline QB one and certainly a guy that you're really happy to have in Superflex. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, you know, in Superflex, he's, he's been a fantastic find. And, uh, you know, even if you're struggling anywhere at quarterback and uh, single quarterback, I mean, you know, I, I think he's got to be your go-to guy. And I think I'd, I'd spend up a little bit on your, your fab to get him this week. If, if, uh, he's not owned anywhere, uh, you know, I, I do have a couple leagues where I'll probably put in some bids for him just because, you know, I need him. I don't really have anybody who's really taking control of my quarterback position and uh, you know, what you got to do what you got to do. And uh, so hope, hopefully it keeps going, but I, I like what I'm seeing there. And um, you know, they're just not doing very good at running the ball. And, and so, you know, it, when you've got that going on uh, you know, just lean into the passing game and just go with it is, is pretty much the way I'm going at it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into uh, an area of expertise uh, for Coop here. Uh, something this this is where he first caught my eye uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, you know talking about the tight ends, and uh, you know I really like your approach to to solving the tight end puzzle every year. Uh, the only the only advice I've got to give you on that is uh, you know please put it out in June next year instead. Of- <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 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 i get that's the thing is it's like it's so hard to time it last year i put it out yep. so late and uh, i tried to move it back earlier the thing is it's just like 
if I put it out earlier, the whole thing ends up with a million edits on it. Like if you go look at it yep. now, I try to edit when a news comes in. I'm trying to keep it fresh. If I put it out in June, man, it'd be a full time job. Bro. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just I'm just giving you a hard time. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, talk to us a little bit. Why do, why do you think we're so bad at picking tight ends? I mean, most people just they they hate picking the tight end position. I mean, it's like they you know they'd almost rather pick a kicker than pick a tight end. Right, right. And it is, there's two different versions of hating the tight end too, right? There's the people that say, I'm taking Kelsey at one overall and I'm never thinking about it again, right? And then there's the version that says, I'm just not drafting one at all. And maybe they don't even draft one the entire draft or they take the 17th off the board, you know? But um, but what I try and do is, uh, and I think the reason that people are, um, you know, they don't, don't do well at it is because is, first of all, they don't focus on the right details. And second of all, as much as this this sucks is that the the right details aren't easy to find you know what i mean so people are looking at they for instance they look at targets right and you look at um even just even target share but when you think about like raw stats like targets and touchdowns think about the saints game this weekend they ran 44 offensive snaps right the the week one the lions ran 92 that's basically two Saints games. You know what I mean? So when you look at just target totals and things like that, it can be super misleading. Uh, and then, you know, the behind the scenes stats that uh, that I use, like, for instance, I look at pass blocking. And I'm, at, I'm, I'm wondering how often is this guy in the game and he's being asked to pass block, which he might as well not even be in the game, right? That's a stat that is difficult to find. You know what I mean? It's like you're the paying for pro football focus. I try and share that info wherever I can, you know, but it's like you're the paying for pro football focus or you kind of trying to backdoor player profiler stats and things like that. You know, it's it's just, it's just it's a very annoying position. But, uh, you know, that's why I do my best to, you know, comb through all that junk and then tell people, hey, here are the guys I'm going after. Here are the guys I'm stashing in a way that is reasonable for you not to, you know, I know not everyone can hold four tight ends on their bench. But I'm basically saying, you know, with the whole the yin yang tight end strategy that I talk about, this guy is safe to start. Make sure you have a safe, another guy on your bench that has upside, you know. So uh, that's just the basics of, of why I think it's difficult for so many people is that it's just it's not the position is not like any other, you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times I think, you know, you get you get tight ends that kind of fall into value for a year, uh, but it's not necessarily sustainable because what caused them to fall into value is something that the team is actively trying to fix for the next year. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why my, for anybody that plays, I know you guys do a lot of dynasty stuff. The um, my advice, my one piece of advice for dynasty is very simple. It's to roster talent, but start opportunity. So you want to get as many talented players as you can, but when you're competing to win, you need to trade and get yourself a guy who has a top two upside on on his team because it's like, you know, so many guys are sitting there rostering guys like Jonu because they were talented or guys like Goddard, and you lose to, to people that are starting Logan Thomas who just kind of backdoored his way into, uh, you know, being the second target on the team, you know. So uh, that's that's my dino advice right there. You want to get a, collect as many talented guys, but when it's time to compete, you have to go out and get somebody who has the opportunity. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, it, it, as you said, it's not only just about uh, snap share, it's not only just about routes run, uh, you know, but it's also, you know, figuring out, you know, how quickly does the offense move, you know, how many opportunities per game are they going to have, even if they've got a good target share, uh, you know, like you say, in the Saints, it could be uh, a, a high target share on the Saints is not as good, you know, if you get 20. Oh, just got a connection there. Yeah, I think Dan. I think Dan froze up. Um, but yeah, like like he was saying, it's uh, it's it's kind of uh, it's a difficult position to to gauge in terms of the of the of the stats. Um, and you know, I think that was a great point you made um, about collecting those guys like the John Ooze and then Dallas Goddard's. Um, what what would be a guy that would be a you know potential Logan Thomas for this year? Um, that you maybe could see come into a really big, you know, potential volume as the season is long that, that people could really lean on that might be under the radar. Yeah. Well, if there's if there's one step, if there's one thing, you know, simple piece of advice for redraft that I give people to just put in the back of your mind, right, is you need to envision you really need to envision a path to being a top two target on the team. Right. So you look at um, the thresholds for these tight ends. All the you know, if you're in a 
a 10 or 12 man league, if your tight end isn't top five or six, then you have a below average tight end mathematically, you know, it's, and the difference between tight end 10 and tight end 16 was 10 fantasy points last year. So in reality, people are like, oh, yeah, he's a tight end one. Well, that really doesn't matter to me. Uh, I, I want top five tight ends. And when you look at the top five tight ends going all the way back to uh, basically if you take uh, top five tight ends, they've all gotten either 90 plus targets or 10 plus touchdowns going all the way back to Randy McMichael in 2003. So in your mind, you got to be painting a picture on, you know, whether this guy's going to catch 10 touchdowns or whether he's going to have 90 targets. And I don't project guys to catch 10 touchdowns unless they're doing what Rob Gronkowski is currently doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like before the season, I sit there and I'm like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can project Travis Kelsey to have 10. He probably, he'd probably be the best at it, but he's the only, he's the only tight end that's done it twice in, you know, the last five, six years. So, um, so that's what you need to do is kind of paint yourself a picture of how can this guy be a top two target on his team? You know, either the leading guy or the second guy, basically the vet, pretty much all of them are the top two targets on their team. Uh, Robert Tonian scored 11 touchdowns before him. You have to go back to Martellus Bennett, 2014. So uh, th- that's what I'm looking for. So I'm looking at guys like the Patriots tight ends, and I uh, know I saw the question at the bottom of the screen. Their usage has been good to a certain degree. Yeah, the so they are flops in the box score numbers so far. Uh, Johnny Smith, uh, just this week, you know, he had five targets and he was playing a limited snap share because he, you know, his hip was uh, he's got he's got an issue with his hip and it's it was a blowout anyway. But uh, he didn't block on a single pass play. And if you look at Hunter Henry. He played 22 snaps at wide receiver. He would, you know, he played almost all the snaps. He was running almost all the routes. It was just a blowout. You know what I mean? They, there's no reason to throw it to a guy with a hurt shoulder or a hurt hip. But these are the guys who could be top targets on their teams. Guys like Evan Ingram coming back. We don't know what his role is. Uh, a guy like uh, Cole Komet, you know, it, it, with a new quarterback, we don't know if it's going to be Darnell Mooney or if it's going to be Cole Komet after Allen Robinson. You know, a guy like Juwan Johnson, you know, who's ascending, his snap shares ascending. He just ran more routes this week than Adam Trotman, right? Uh, even a guy like Jordan Akins, where, you know, everyone's hurt except Brandon Cooks, and there's a new quarterback in there. It's like these are the kind of paths that you need to kind of try and paint yourself a picture of how can this guy be top two. I mean, Noah Fant now – uh, can be top two. Logan Thomas with no Curtis Samuel can be top two. Dallas Goddard, why can't he be a top two guy? It's like, as long as you can paint some sort of picture, you can find upside. That's kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, it, and I think you can break that down to per game level too, uh, which you kind of alluded to. Uh, but, you know, like if, if Austin Hooper is going to be uh, one of the main remaining weapons for for Cleveland uh you know then at least for this game he's got a path to you know Mm -hmm. top two on targets on the team um and that's what you're looking for and then another thing is if you if you keep track of you know which which defenses are really terrible against the tight ends for the most part I don't track um you know like this you know, this team's terrible against wide receivers. This team's terrible against running backs. I mean, you know, that it, it helps you, but, you know, there's so many wide receivers or running backs, you're not exactly sure all the time who's going to benefit the most and who's not. Uh, but with a tight end, a lot of times you can, you can find one or two or three teams over the course of the year that are just absolutely struggling against tight ends and just pick on them week after week after week. You know, and sometimes the guy that, uh, you know, the tight end who's playing them isn't going to be a available because it's Travis Kelsey uh you know well tough luck that week but maybe one of those other D yeah yeah I mean that's that's huge for the for the the matchup wise and there's also on the flip side of that there are tight end killers out there the New England Patriots have been just brutal to tight ends for over a year now it seems to be going again this year where Mike Gusecki um you know gets zero you know zero catches week one um there's individual players isaiah simmons now for the cardinals um uh, and the fact that the car isaiah simmons is so good they you know devondre campbell they let him leave now he's with the packers i mean he could you know he's been known to be kind of a hired gun tight end cover guy some of the safeties like jamal adams it's like it's it's tough to to do it that way but when you see teams like the jaguars consistently getting roasted by the tight end the absolutely stream guy that's how you should definitely be targeting stream guys look for you know injury like injuries like like in joku or uh austin hooper i, I hooper ran more routes so i like him a little better but um you know 
use that stuff to your advantage. And that's stuff that you can find online if you just, you know, search for uh, points versus the tight end, you know. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good one with the uh, – that's a good segue. Um, so you're you're a Hooper over Njoku guy. Are you a – you're Johnson clearly at this point over Troutman if you were going to bet on one of the Saints uh, tight ends uh, kind of stepping up for the rest of the season? I, I think I am at this point. Uh, so I was – I was Juwan Johnson coming in, and then after the week one, I was kind of like, we got to pump the brakes here because Troutman played 51 snaps. Johnson only played 12. I know he caught the two touchdowns, which was exciting and great for us starting in DFS, but uh, I was a little worried. But, I mean, this week, uh, Juwan Johnson came out. His snaps increased. He uh, you know, he ran uh, 18 routes, and Troutman only ran 11, I think it was, or it might have been 16 and 11. But uh, either way, I have a hard time trusting Troutman at this point, um, just given – that he's kind of running more of a Josh Hill type role than a Jared Cook type role, you know. And then with Austin Hooper and Cole, Austin Hooper and David Njoku, I think Njoku is probably the superior athlete. I think a lot of dynasty owners have thought that for a long time, but Austin Hooper is getting the better deployment. He, you know, he ran twenty routes. Njoku ran fifteen. Harrison Bryant ran twelve. I was just looking at it before we got on here. So, um, you know, I, for now it's kind of hard to, you know, kind of pivot from you know, the guy they paid all the money to and who's running the most routes to the secondary guy for me, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's great. And then just two other, two other tight end rooms, um, just to pick your brain, um, Dallas, it seems like it's, it's kind of two guys pretty close in the rankings. I've been a little more impressed with Schultz so far. I'm not sure which way you're leaning with that one. And maybe you could touch on Pittsburgh situation as well. Yeah, so we sh- with the with the Cowboys one, the big problem I had with that coming in is that top two target thing. I mean, that that's out of the range of possibility. But some people need these players. I mean, there's so so yeah. many different leagues nowadays, the tight end premiums and all these things where not everybody only cares about the upside, you know. So a, a decision has to be made, and it's it, it, that situation makes it so difficult because Dalton Schultz is playing more snaps, but Blake Jarwin actually ran more routes. Uh, I think Schultz is the starting tight end at this point, but Jarwin is the kind of the guy they throw in there, um, you know, in when they want to go bigger and do a, pa- a you know pass type situation. Um, I think that for now it's a coin flip, but once they get Gallup back, I think it goes back to being okay. We're not going to run as many two tight end sets, and we kind of got to pick somebody, and then it will be Schultz. Um, you know, it, it's th- that's just that one's such a tough situation. It's really. Um, you know, the, the underlying – the problem is that the underlying numbers don't really give us an answer through two games. Uh, it would be nice if Schultz played more snaps and he ran more routes, but the fact that one guy's being asked to pass block a little bit is, you know, that's the kind of the red flag for Schultz for me. Um, with the Steelers situation, that is a crazy one because they started out as co-starters and Ebron was running more routes, and that seems to have flipped this week. Uh, Pat Fryermuth now both ran more – uh, played more snaps, and he ran more routes. Uh, and he played more snaps in the slot. Eric Ebron played almost entirely in line. Uh, he only played five, I believe it was five snaps at wide receiver. Only one was out wide, four in the slot, whereas Frymuth played like eight in the slot. He lined up out wide. So I think that, you know, they've kind of made their decision there, like the changing the guard. We saw it with Cole Komet at midseason last year. Him and Jimmy Graham just switched roles straight up, you know. Sometimes people, they, sometimes teams are just like, you know what, time to just – Start planning for the future. Give this guy the reps. Ebron's not going to be here next year, you know. So I think uh, at this point, Frymuth is the guy there. But at the same time, that's another situation where they have so many wide receivers that it makes it tough, you know. So it makes it tough for me to trust them outside of DFS. Yeah, Frymuth. It's interesting for me. I'm I'm excited about Frymuth. I want to see how they use him in a game that Deontay Johnson could be missing, Mm. and it. It reminds me a little bit, and obviously the, the usage will be less, but it reminds me a little bit of how Tomlin treated Claypool, where Claypool started the year out more rotationally, and then they kind of just – it was right after the bye week, Claypool came out and had his smash game. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if, if Fryermuth might um, exceed expectations. I have a lot of him in Dynasty. Um, what about you, Dan? Anything with, with those uh, those end rooms? <laughs> Yeah, the, I, I think with Firemuth, uh, you know, you guys are right. He's kind of the future, and I'm looking forward to to seeing him this week and see what happens. Um, and in some cases, he's you know, 
those guys end up being the future by default because they're more veteran tight end a lot of times understands the blocking schemes a little bit better. And so that's why they just end up kind of naturally having to take on a little bit more of that role. And it does free up the the new guy to, you know, get out there and run a few more routes, which, you know, it is, is great. I mean, it works well for the team and it, it also works well for us in fantasy. If we can, if we can identify, you know, which one is the one who's going to be running those routes, uh, that's all we're looking for. So. Yeah. That's the battle really the, in the, yeah. within the team battle, you know, it's, mm-hmm. You got to identify who the blocker is because uh, you look at a guy like Dallas Goddard who grades out as like a top two block blocking tight end in the league every year. That's what keeps him in line. And that's why Zach Ertz ran more routes last week. Uh, same thing would happen with John Lee Smith and Anthony Ferkser, right? Is like Michael Pruitt gets hurt and then Taylor Luong gets hurt. Who are you going to ask to block, right? You mm-hmm. need help at the line now. You're going to ask Anthony Ferkser to line up and block? No, you're going to ask John Lee Smith. And that's what leads – Anthony Ferkser to go off for over hundred yards against the Texans last year when Adam Humphreys is out. It's just like, you know, you have to think of it the way a coach would think about the, how to deploy these guys. And that's what confuses us so much is that we look at it and say, John Smith is better at catching passes than Anthony Ferkser is. Right. Like Mm -hmm. I think everyone agrees that, but what we don't think is blocking is might be more important to the team in real life, you know? So it's just, it's tough. Who's better at keeping my quarterback from getting killed? Right. Exactly. And that's what happens at running back, too. You know, it's kind of crazy sometimes. So uh, little things to think about. Yep. One one uh, one, uh, you know, upper echelon tight end. Um, just curious to, to see your thoughts. I'm, I'm a little concerned about George Kittle. Um, he's got nine targets in, in two games. Um, you know, he had a decent game one. And then last week was was, you know, a pretty much a nothing game. Um is there any concern there? Um, they're they're really targeting Debo heavily. Um, are you projecting Kittle to get back to you know a, a top three, or is he should he be treated more like a you know like a top six guy at this point? Yeah, so I think Kittle's going to be just fine. Um, so if you want to move Hawkinson ahead of Kittle, then I would say go go ahead. But it's like w- when you're talking about trading, you're not going to trade. You're not going to really do that trade. Um, and here's the situation really is that you think about that first game, right? That game really in all reality was a complete blowout, right? It, in any normal game, if you're, if you have the, if you're up 41, 17 and you have the football with six minutes left, that game's over. You know what I mean? So then, then, you know, after that, there was the onside kick and the fumble and, you know, they really didn't need to use him the first game in the, in the second game. He, you know, and then the first game he blocked on 10 run, 10 pass plays. Cause they just were like, you know, we're just running the clock out, you know. In the second game, his deployment was a lot better. It was he ran more routes than any player on the team, more than Debo, more than anybody else. He only pass blocked on four snaps. I think that the Eagles just might be a team that's a tough matchup for tight ends. I mean, they bottled up Kyle Pitts the first game too, and then Pitts looked better second game. You know, it's like we expect monster things from this guy, but you look out at the tight end landscape landscape. I'd, if I had a tight end that was that caught four passes week one and then four passes week two, I'd be pretty happy with things. You know what I mean? So I think that the people that have George Kittle sit tight. If you want to try and buy low on him, I would go for it. But I don't think they look at George Kittle and think this isn't the same guy we've always had. I think it's just a situation where they destroy the Lions and there was no sense getting your guy hurt. Um, you know, when you're up 41-17, I mean, like, why would you – don't don't you don't throw it to your superstars, you know? And in the second game – uh, I think the Eagles might have just, you know, had a good game plan for him, but I, I think Kittle's going to be just fine. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and then, and especially with Kittle because I mean the guy just he's he's a wild man out there. He does not like to go down, right. and you know, so if the game is in hand, uh, throwing it to him and allowing him to go out there and try to get himself hurt again uh, probably isn't the best. You know, for your your long term team uh, goals, right? And I, 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 I'm the guy that wasn't that high on Kittle or Pitts, but now I'm defending both of them. You know what I mean? It's just like <laughs> the numbers are the numbers. Like at first, I would love for Pitts to not be good, and when people were like, "Oh, he wasn't good week one," I was like, "Well, you know, he played wide receiver 32 times. I mean, this guy's probably right. gonna be pretty good." Uh, and and the other thing with Kittle is that he's never re he's got a lot of targets. He's never really killed you with uh with volume. This is a guy who has. Uh, you know, he's got like 
uh, it's something crazy like eight plays over 60 yards and no other tight end has more than like two. You know what I mean? Like he, he's going to take monster chunks out of, out of a bunch of these teams and then we're going to be like, oh, there he is. You know what I mean? Like just barreling over safeties. So uh, I'm not worried that about, you know, about him having any issues moving forward. So, yeah, yep, agreed. Uh, you know, he's he's solid and, uh, you know, he's always been a key cog in that offense. So, and, and speaking of uh, offenses and, and passing, uh, why don't we move into talking a little bit about passing trees and, uh, you know, what are what are you seeing uh, across the NFL? You know, are there are there offenses that you're really trying to target because you like, uh, you know, how narrow the passing tree is or you like, uh, you know, you, you think there's one branch of and we could continue what Dan was just talking about. Um, you know, is there is there a takeaway with you know the way maybe the way the league's moving, um, in terms of you know concentrated passing trees? And um, do you see any particular teams this year that you're that you're looking to, to you know potentially get involved with um, that are kind of meeting that criteria? Yeah, I mean, for um, I think the main thing for me for fantasy right is the highly consolidated snap and target share teams that the teams that are successfully doing it because a lot of times you think that you can't just have two guys uh, it doesn't work but i mean you look at teams like like now that we've seen it and we've seen it working again this year i'm definitely interested in getting either of the vikings um not it, osborne's fine and all but i mean thielen and jefferson thielen ran us uh every time they passed the football he ran around and that's what he's doing last season too tyler lockett and dk metcalf AJ Brown and Julio Jones, like the teams that could pull it off with just the two high, highly consolidated snap shares. That's how you get these seasons, like the uh, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin season, or the um, you know Demarius Tom. Remember those Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders seasons? Like oh, those absolutely, are, those are awesome. You know what I mean? Especially when the tight end's not involved either, like the Vikings. It's like just three guys. You know what I mean? I, I, go away, at KJ Osborne. We don't we don't want you out here. We, we'll just get twelve targets to both the wide receivers and. 30, 30 touches for Dalvin Cook, and we'll call it a day. Um, and but uh, you know, from a general NFL fan sta- standpoint, um, I love these offenses that are really spreading it out. Uh, I hope the air raid succeeds uh, with Cliff Kingsbury. It's just so much fun to see uh, DeAndre Hopkins running the intermediates and the deep guys and the screens and stuff. Uh, on the flip side, I hate the, what the Ravens do. But it's just all this substitution and they're using fullbacks and the flooding where it's like five guys all in the same part of the field. It's just like it's just not it's not to me. It's not enjoyable as a fan. You know what I mean? I don't want to see every wide receiver on the team playing a 30 percent snap share like Devin DuVernay playing 30 percent and, uh, you know, all these, you know, uh, Willie Sneed, I know he's not on the team anymore, but he basically was out there playing guard and from the slot. You know what I mean? Like nobody wants to see that. <laughs> nobody wants to see Nick Boyle. Nobody wants to see Patrick Ricard. Just you know what I mean? Like uh, just as a fan, you know. I know it works in real life, but I mean, I don't know. What What do you guys think? What kind of offenses do you like to see? I agree with you on Arizona. I think Arizona is just uh, unbelievably fun to watch. Um, Tampa Bay is incredibly, uh, you know, pleasing to watch. Um, yes. I've been I've been happy with um with with what the Rams are doing this year. I think that they've got a real game plan um with with Stafford. Um and then obviously the the Dallas offense when they're at full strength is 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 a lot of fun to watch as well. Um and I'll disagree on that. I think Patrick Ricard is is a fun is a fun guy to watch. He does some <laughs> does some good things out there. Shout out to shout out to Ravens Nation. Okay. What about okay. you? What about you? I, you did. He's a good dude. Hey, I, I, he seems like a good dude, right? He's a, U, a UMass guy, right? So he's from up this way. So yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you have to love uh, three pound fullbacks as well. Yeah, he's big. He's a big boy. It's just you know, every time he comes in, a wide receiver comes out of the game. I'm a fancy guy, so come on. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. definitely neg- negative correlation for fantasy with Patrick Ricard. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah, the main things I look for is I, I either look for that narrow passing tree or I look for that just absolutely elite quarterback. Um, you know, and when it, when I say elite, I mean somebody who really is a field general and, uh, you know, is always throwing to the open guy uh, where you get, you know, like, uh, you know, Breeze back in his heyday, Peyton Manning back in his heyday, certainly Tom Brady now. Uh, you know, guys like those, whoever, you know, whoever they end up focusing on, 
uh, you know, it, they're going to take you to a championship. Uh, you know, so those those court those wide receivers tied to the elite quarterbacks. The you know the the really good quarterbacks, maybe an elite quarterbacks with just you know two maybe three good options, or sometimes you know just that that quarterback who's just good enough to get the job done. He's got that one elite receiver. Mm -hmm. uh, you know sometimes that's a that's a really productive thing to mine as well. Uh, you know, but the one thing he, that I'm always really careful of uh, is the you know the well the target's got to go somewhere, so I'm going to. You know, I'm going to pick up Tyler Conklin, um, you know, not knowing anything about, you know, what the Vikings think about him. Uh, you know, you we're taking him just because Irv Smith is gone. Right. And that's a lot of times not the best move because, you know, targets are like, you know, they're 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 drawn to talent like a magnet, um, you know, and so. If you've got the guy who's you just think, well, he's you know, he's standing in the right place, so he's going to get those targets. But there's somebody else that you don't know as well because, you know, the fantasy community hasn't been focusing on him, but he's actually more talented. He's actually going to do better for the team. That's where those targets are going to end up going. So a lot of times just the, you know, the best thing to do in those situations is, you know, if you want to if you want to take a, a, a really late guess at it. Uh, you know, go ahead and do that or really cheap guess in whatever way it might be, you know, on the waiver wire or whatever, uh, you know, but then, uh, you know, just let the situation play out. And uh, a lot of times you'll find all of a sudden, you know, somebody like KJ Osborne, you know, after that first week, I was like, okay, this is where they're going. Everybody, you know, a lot of people in my leagues were, you know, they didn't bid on him at all. Um, and I was jumping all over him because I'm going, yeah, okay, this is the third guy that we're looking for in this offense. Uh, you know, because it's not going to be just two guys, so there's probably going to be a third guy. This is now looking like the most likely guy. Get him for cheap, and then uh, you know, see what happens. Yep, I mean that's the, that's the big thing about the like looking at the underlying stats because if you look at Tyler Conklin, week one, he blocked on eight pass plays and they didn't run that many pass plays. You know what I mean? Right. So he was toast. If you look at last year, Logan Thomas, right? He was lining up at wide receiver. He was running a ton of routes. He wasn't doing much, though. So, Dan, to a certain degree, for the first five games, he was the guy you kind of described as the dude who was just there in that position, but but not really with the talent. And then he kind of developed it as, you know, he kind of earned it at a certain point. You know what I mean? And then he became a reliable target. That's why I look at some of these guys like that are new to the teams, like Hunter Henry and Johnny Smith, and say, okay, I know there's talent there. I know that there's opportunity there. I'm, I'm going to stash them and see if they can be this year's Logan Thomas that comes on strong because that's why you got to, you know, try and have a safe guy so they can stash these other guys is that, uh, you know, nobody was starting Darren Waller week one when he broke out or Mark Andrews when he broke out or, or Logan Thomas even. You know, it's like uh, you have to kind of try and play both sides of the coin, you know. So, But I, I know exactly what you're saying with that. You want to jump on the opportunity, but the talent is what, you know, gets the ball your way. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, targets are targets are earned. I think mm -hmm. that that's uh, that's something that you know people really have to buy into, and I think one team we didn't really touch on with this concentrated target tree, um, to me as as the as the season moves along, Atlanta is going to be just one of the most predictable teams going. You brought up Kyle Pitts um, and how many targets he's receiving, how they're lining up at the wide receiver, um, and we all know about Calvin Ridley. It seems like as the season progresses it's going to be those two guys um, with maybe a little bit of a mix of the running backs. I think uh, that's going to be one of the easier um, you know, tandems to kind of lean on knowing what you're going to get week in, week out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh my God. Absolutely. Cause it's like Russell, I, I the only thing I was worried about, I was like, you know what? Russell Gage played a lot of flanker at the end of last year. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe they, you know, he just takes on a bigger role and Pitts doesn't figure it out. But from what I've seen, Pitt, you know, they have Pitts lining up as a wide receiver, playing wide receiver. Hayden Hurst is on the field too, which is honestly when you have the guy that's doing that role, uh, that's fine. Like Nick Boyle played 769 snaps in 2019. Mark Andrews only played 457. But Boyle was, you know, the guy with his hand in the dirt doing the dirty work. Like I'm absolutely fine with Hayden Hurst playing if that means Pitts can play uh, – wide receiver that's the best situation so you know I, again i was a guy that was hesitant on pits i've already moved him up 
I moved him up after week one. Like I, mm-hmm. I saw the way that some, you know, some of these other guys were working. I was like, you know what? If people are fading this guy, go get him because I mean, he is a freakazoid. And if they're going to use him like full every play, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the another another team slot, Cincinnati. I'm excited to see them as as the season moves on. Um, you know, we we've seen Jamar Chase kind of flash, and I expect him to kind of get better. Um, obviously Higgins and, and Boyd are still there. They're not using the tight end that much. Um, and they're not, you know, throwing to mixing that often. So I'm, I'm excited about, um, you know, that, that wide receiver core. Is that, is that a team you've got your eye on as well? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, the main thing that I've been interested in is seeing, you know, which, which guy was going to come off the field in two, uh, wide receiver sets, um, and, uh, and two tight end, two wide receiver sets. They haven't really been doing that. They've just been using yeah. three three wide receivers. They put in Drew Sample every once in a while for like a full-on power formation, but they're really not throwing out of those anyway. So you're not losing those pass snaps in those situations. And, I mean, I don't know about you guys, man, but T. Higgins, man, he looks enormous out there. He's a like, beast. He, T. Higgins, he's a, he's a, a, <laughs> I swear, the first, the, first, the first Sunday I'm watching the game, I'm like, who is this tight end 85? And how do I not know who that is? And I was like, Dude, that's T. Higgins? I thought, I thought, that, was, I thought that was like – uh, CJ Uzuma, I was like, Jesus, he looks huge, man. So, I mean, it's 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 easy to get excited about a guy when he's that big and getting that many targets. I don't care what position he plays. I mean, like, uh, you know, he, he looks like he he's on the Amari Cooper, uh, you know, meatballs for breakfast and uh, bench bench press for lunch plan. So, absolutely, he's a, he looks looks like a proper alpha out there. That's yes. a proper proper alpha. What yeah, saying. yeah. So, yeah, that's fun. Yeah, and Chase, Chase is such a nice compliment to him too. I mean, you know, that's Chase, that's such a great combo. Chase, I mean, that that only makes Jamar Chase better because yeah. if you have a guy that can go out and tether his foot to the line and play split end, uh, so that you know, so you have a tight end on one side and uh, you know, T Higgins tethered with his foot to the line, saying, "Come and try and jam me. I'm, I'll throw you. I'll throw you out the club." That lets everybody else have a foot off the line, go in motion, go all over the place. So, uh, you know, the better T. Higgins is, the better the second wide receiver can be on that team. Or even the third one, if they're going to just roll three wide receivers out every single play like they have been. You know? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, Tyler Boyd is somebody you can probably still go out and get real cheap in Dynasty right now because, you know, every everybody is so infatuated with Higgins and Chase. And, you know, Boyd is going to be in there uh, sucking up a lot of targets. So, mm-hmm. I don't have any problem uh, rolling him out, starting him where I've got him, uh, you know, if I need a receiver. Yeah, for sure. So any uh, any receivers who you're kind of eyeing, uh, you know, that are on the waiver wire or that are, you know, been sitting on your bench and you're you're thinking about throwing them in to, to start, um, you know, whether it – yeah, assuming yeah. assuming you you have a hole at wide receiver, you know, obviously if you're sitting real good at wide receiver, you won't be looking at that as much. But if you get a hole, where, where are you looking at, Coop? Yeah, I mean, like 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 I was saying before, man, I, perfect timing for this because I just did our snap count article. I go through all the snap counts, everything, all the linemen, uh, you know, all the linemen numbers. So I'm looking for guys that are kind of playing ninety percent snap shares, uh, especially in prolific offenses that are you know owned in less than 50, 50% of leagues or so, um, you know, guy we touched on earlier, Darnell Mooney, right? He's play, He played every snap week one, and he played more than Allen Robinson again last week. Uh, he's going to be out there every play. Uh, they traded Anthony Miller away, and Cole Komet had one target that was registered. He had another one that was an uh, offensive pass interference. So, I mean, if, you know, last week was a down week. They threw for 115 yards, but that, they're, they're not going to throw for 115 yards every game. You know what I mean? Like, there's – you can't you know, it's not even feasible so uh i think mooney's a, a good guy to get for cheap uh, i like emmanuel sanders you know it's when someone asks me for a breakout and i say a 34 five year old guy or whatever it's like gotta, it's kind of tough but i mean he's playing 90 percent of the snaps i mean in a in josh allen's offense and cole beasley uh this week he only played 60 percent, and gabriel davis played like 30 or 40 so uh that's what i look for i'm looking for these guys that you know could be a big part of the offense moving forward we already touched on Rondell Moore. Uh, I also like the idea of if you have deep benches, grab Rondell Moore and Christian Kirk. You know what I mean? Like see if one of them can really separate themselves. If you have deep benches, grab Elijah Moore and Jamison Crowder. Right now it's 
Corey Davis, he's probably owned everywhere by now, but Elijah Moore and Corey Davis are playing 90% of the snaps. They ran into a buzzsaw this weekend. It was a bad game. They're going to have better games. Is it going to be Jamison Crowder when he comes back? I mean, what do you guys think on that one? When Jamison Crowder comes back, does he get a full snap share and Elijah Moore goes to more of a platoon guy? Or does uh, Elijah Moore – has Elijah Moore kind of earned that and Crowder's just a slot guy as he's kind of been for a while? Uh, what do you guys think there on those guys? I think they're committed to Elijah Moore, and I think that Elijah Moore is going to be on the field a lot, especially as the season goes south and they're not going to win a lot of games. Um, I think that that coaching staff is all in on Elijah Moore. Um, and I see, I think we'll see him, um, you know, pick up his play as the season moves along. How about you, Dan? Yeah, same. I think, uh, you know, Crowder probably functions best in the slot. And they told us, you know, when they restructured his contract that, uh, you know, they're, they're not looking for him to, to be a major piece on this offense. Uh, yeah. You know, they're going to get what they can out of him this year and, and let him walk. Uh, you know, and he's also somebody I wouldn't be surprised if he moves at the trade deadline. So, you know, he's a he's a guy I've been kind of acquiring here and there where I've got room on my bench in Dynasty uh, to, you know, just see what happens. I mean, you know, any any time you're betting on a trade, you know, that's probably a bad bet. Uh, but if it's someplace where you can just hold for super cheap and it's not, you know, there's there's nobody else more compelling to use that roster spot on. You know, those are those are the kind of players I like to hold for those spots, you know, where where I can envision something, you know, really positive happening out of nowhere uh, like that. So but I, I do think he's going to get involved um, with the Jets. And I do think, uh, you know, he's probably going to be a little bit of a security blanket for uh, uh, for Wilson as well. You know, so even if he's not on the field all the time, I expect he'll have a fairly healthy target numbers. What's interesting about that is that so I think you know they they'd say Elijah Moore is not a Jamison Crowder replacement, right? right? So I think you know Theo Theo kind of had it right where it's like Crowder's the split end. They just split up the, the positions, right? Crowder's the split end, Elijah Moore's the flanker, and and Jamison Crowder's the slot. So uh, Braxton Berrios is playing slot right now, coming out of the game. But as you kind of mentioned, Braxton Berrios has been the safety blanket. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So if Crowder comes back and just takes that role, and now you have a better player in that role, you know, that you're right. That Crowder could be the guy. I mean, Cole Beasley last year played a 60% snap share, and he was the safety blanket too on his team. So, uh, you know, it's not the end-all be-all. It's just when I'm looking for upside with unproven situations, that's where I go. I go to like, all right, give me the snaps, and we'll figure out the targets later, you know. Two other two other wide receivers that uh, have impressed me um, early in the season. I'd be interested to hear your guys' thoughts on um, Michael Pittman, who seems like he took a big step forward last game. Um, I think that game one was maybe a uh, you know it was maybe a, a, a game plan type situation. Seems like they involved their backs a little more. Um, but last last week they they really leaned on Pittman. Um, the target share, I think we, he got like over thirty percent of the team's targets. Um, but he looks like a, the kind of guy who could continue his strong play. And also Holly Brown. Hollywood Brown looks great to me so far this season. Um, you know, you mentioned Mooney. I think that those 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 kind of names uh, have, have been guys that kind of exceeded expectations. Obviously, Debo Samuel, who we don't need to talk about. He's just playing lights out. But I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts on Pittman and Brown. And will they will Brown keep it up? Um, and is Pittman the kind of guy that you see taking an upward tra- trajectory? Dan, you want to go first on this one? You want me to go first? Yeah, so for Pittman, I think, you know, obviously a lot of it's going to depend on Wentz being healthy. Um, you know, I, I'm not super big on, uh, was it Eason? The start, Eason, the back yeah. Up there. yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, he he has not looked great. Um, you know, it about the best you can hope for in that kind of situation is that he just really, you know, dials in on Pittman and, and focuses on him completely. Um, and Hollywood Brown. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely bullish on him. I think, you know, Bateman is, he's behind. I do have Bateman in a few places and I think he will, you know, he'll get some run later in the year, assuming he can get back to healthy. Um, but it, Jackson has developed a good connection with Hollywood Brown. And, uh, you know, it's really shown in the last half of last season and the first part of this season. Uh, so I think he's going to continue to look his way. So I'm I'm totally fine with Hollywood Brown. Yeah. What do you think? 
with Pitt and Wewell. So for Hollywood Brown, he, he, Emmanuel Sanders, Darnell Mooney, uh, once you get beyond the guy, so like, you know, the, one of the one of the other reasons I go for the top two targets is it's very rare for a team to have three guys get 100 plus targets. It's happened, uh, you know, less than five percent of the time over the last uh, seven years or so. Right. So uh, when I look at and last year, every top 24 wide receiver got 100 plus targets. But when you look through the past few years at guys that can break that top 24 wide receiver threshold without 100 targets, it's it's. Feel it's um, high efficient field stretcher, uh, stretchers. You know, the Stefan Diggs did it, Tyler Lockett did it, Tyreek Hill did it, you know, and like a guy like Hollywood Brown is that exact type of dude, you know, uh, maybe even a Rondell Moore, Emmanuel Sanders, guys that are taking on Darnell Mooney, who runs like a four two something or whatever it is, like guys that can take off big chunks. That's that's kind of the only way you can sneak sneak in the top 24 without a ton of targets. So I'm right there with you on. Uh, on, on that crew, you know, so, uh, and then as far as Michael Pittman goes, so many people were saying, oh, you got to get rid of him because he didn't break some rookie threshold for stats. It's like, dude, you can't just lump everyone into these, like, you know, uh, this isn't, we're not fishing where you check the size and you throw them back. It's like the dude had, he, he got hurt. He had compartment syndrome and they told him that he might lose his, his leg. You know what I mean? It's like, this guy was badly injured. He's in the hospital. It's like, so you're going to say because he didn't get X amount of yards because, you know, he had compartment syndrome, which I had to Google, you know, and it doesn't sound great. Uh, it's like, uh, I just, I'm not, I'll never be one of those guys that says I'm going to quit on this guy because he's been hurt. You know, uh, it, it's kind of getting, maybe it'll, it's getting there with Paris Campbell, but I mean, with Michael Pittman, there's no way you could watch him going up against Jalen Ramsey in that defense last week and not come out of that feeling encouraged, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, compartment syndrome, that was serious. I mean, that's that's basically what uh, pretty well ended Hakeem Nix's uh, career. Uh, oh, really? that's, oh, that's what he had? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's it's one of those deals that, uh, you know, it's it, it is really definitely serious. And and, uh, you know, you, people do lose limbs from it. So, you know, it's nothing to play around with. Uh, you know, the nice thing is, is, you know, he was able to make a, a good recovery from it. Uh, that doesn't always happen. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. You got to give him the benefit of the doubt and really almost kind of treat this almost like a, a second rookie year. And, uh, you know, he's he's coming out strong. So, uh, you know, and he, he showed out well at the end of last year, too. Uh, in the playoffs, he he started to look pretty well, pretty good as well. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, one uh, let's let's hit the running backs real quick before we get ourselves out of here. Uh, you know, we're 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 not quite to an hour and a half, but we're getting there. But uh, let's let's talk about the running backs a little bit. And uh, what what running backs, uh, Cooper, are you looking to target to get on your bench before they pop? Uh, you know, who are some guys that you added last week on the waiver wire? Who you who are you eyeing this week and uh, where are you going with that? Oh, so we're talking on this one, um, you know, guys to add. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I uh, the guy that I liked from the very beginning. Uh, so I was kind of in his camp. You know, uh, you see the shirts, you see stuff hanging here. But James White has always been capable as a pass catcher. Uh, he's caught a pass in every single game going back to the Raiders game in 2017. Right. So midseason 2017, there's like 60 something games in a row where he's caught at least one ball. And in like 50 plus, I think he's 57, he's caught two or more, right? So in any sort of PPR league, uh, you know, especially in these deep leagues that are the, everyone's scrapping, uh, if you can have a guy, you know, he's not going to catch six every week like he has the first two weeks. I mean, maybe he will, you know, going from Cam Newton to Mac Jones, it's definitely an improvement, but he's a guy that, that I'm looking at anywhere where I look at my schedule and I say, oh man, I'm going to need someone to fill in for this bye week in a couple weeks. You know what I mean? Uh, if we're looking for just upside type plays, um, you know, and I guess Ty Johnson is a very similar to James White, except a lot, you know, a little cheaper version. He, you know, he's been playing a ton of pass snaps. Um, if you're looking for upside, maybe a quarter, Corel Patterson. I mean, it, the look at the usage he's had over there, uh, you know, in, in any sort of um, leagues that have return yards that count too, I mean, then it's easier. Do you guys play in draft with Giants at all? Um, I did last year. I didn't this year. Um, but, yeah, with the return yards, that makes a big difference. Right. But yeah, I mean, those are guys I'm looking at. Um, 
obviously if you need a spot start for this week, right? The ad is Sony Michelle, right? Or mm-hmm. I mean, that's a hot one. But uh, I don't know. What about you guys? You guys have any anybody flying under the radar that you're that you're sneaking onto rosters? I mean, I added quarter all Patterson everywhere I could. Um, last week, Dan and I had him um, on a team we share. Um, we actually got him on the second waiver wire run, and I think that that's a great call. Um, it's a kind of name where you know his usage in week one. People kind of just laughed it off because, you know, our preconceived notions of the guy. But um, he looks like the third best player on the Atlanta offense to me. I'm not a Mike Davis fan. Um, I think that their usage was getting tighter last week. Um, Patterson's getting targets. Patterson's getting carries. Um, he gets, you know, carries inside the, the, you know, the red zone or the green zone or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, so he's, he's the kind of guy where he's, he's a slash where I think that he could pick up some of the, the Russell Gage targets and also he'll just continue to eat into Mike Davis. And, you know, Atlanta's Atlanta's 0-2. Um, I think that they're going to do everything they can to beat the Giants. I think this could be a 15-plus touch game for Cordero Patterson. And, um, you know, I think that he, if you're, a, if you're an anchor RB guy or you're a zero RB guy, this could be a guy you start this week. How about you, Dan? Yeah, so I definitely agree with them. Um uh, Jamichael Hasty is still on the waiver wire in a lot of leagues. We don't know how serious his ankle injury is. It, you know, it could keep him out one week. It could keep him out five weeks. They haven't put him on IR yet. If they don't put him on IR by the time uh, waivers run tomorrow, I'm probably going to be putting in some bids on Hasty in uh, leagues where he's available. Uh, you know, just because he, you know, we he could play. I guess this week. I mean, we don't we don't really know. Uh, you know, and that's a team that definitely has a lot of opportunities sitting in front of them. Um, and then other than that, yeah, I think, you know, the, it's, it's starting to look a little thin on the waiver wire and in your deeper leagues, um, you know, and, and in those leagues, then I'm just trying to put on the, um, you know, like a, a Samaj P Ryan or somebody like that, you know, where, if, if a starter gets hurt or Jarek McKinnon would be another good one to add, uh, you know, he finally got a touch this last week and uh, he, he looked good with it. Uh, you know, Daryl Williams is just, he's, he's such a terrible running back. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, Daryl Williams, mom. Uh, I'm, sh- I'm sure your son is a, a fine person, but uh, you know, I, I would rather have Jarek McKinnon in that offense than Daryl Williams. So uh, I'm hoping Andy Reed figures that out as well. Um, but that, yeah, that's where I'm at on those. How about uh, any running backs you guys see that are kind of turning to dust? Who are you really worried about that uh, had some fairly significant draft capital associated with them? Well, Dan, on those, I just want to say on those two things. One, I actually um, snuck um, Jeff Wilson into a couple IR spots where they oh, yes. yeah, nice. are deep. <laughs> <'Cause> I'm, <laughs> yes. like, I'm like, look, I'm like, those tackles, both those tackles graded out in the top five and run, you know, runs last year, um, run blocking last year. So I was like, put anybody back there, right? So yeah, that's a, that's a deep slide. Um, the other one is with the, the Daryl Williams thing. So CEH has had two pass blocking snaps. He's let him pr- pressure on both this year. <laughs> Not good. But they put in Daryl Williams for two. He's also let him pressure on one of them. So they're both graded out pretty poor. I mean, if you four pass blocking snaps, they've let the guy get in three times now. I mean, that could be the could be uh you know the time for Jarek McKinnon to get a shot at it. You know what I mean? It's like uh and that's that's kind of one of the big things I look for for RBs kind of losing their their role and losing their their shine. Um, you know, Ronald Jones last week let Tom Brady get sacked. You know, the week before that he fumbled. The last week he lets the quarterback get sacked. Uh, I'm a little worried about Ronald Jones. So Leonard Fournette is, in my opinion, has been he's had a bad attitude, but he's been the better athlete. Um, and you know, they have Gio Bernard playing just pass snaps, but just the fact that anyone else is playing pass snaps, it kind of concerns me. So I'm a little bit worried about Ronald Jones. I'm not sure if you guys are big Ronald Jones fans or not. I know my buddy JB Barry uh, from the <laughs> besties is a huge Tampa Bay fan. He claims he's not a homer for Ronald Jones, but that's exactly what it is. Um, but uh, sorry, JB. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am big time worried about Ronald Jones in dynasty and redraft because you can't be, you can't turn the ball over t- Tom Brady's been in this league too long. If you turn the ball over and you let let up your block and let him get hit, 
Like you are going straight to the doghouse, and you might never get out. Bruce Arians' doghouse is a uh, pretty deep doghouse, right? I, Keyshawn Vaughn's buried somewhere underneath that. Thing. <laughs> you know, so I mean, he got COVID, and then he was like, "Nah, you're done." You know, so it's just like, I, I don't know. I worry about anybody uh, on a team with three running backs who's who's making mega mistakes like that. Uh, yeah, what about what about you guys? Anybody you guys see kind of falling? Well, I, I just got to say on Keyshawn Vaughn, I mean, according to, to Bruce Arians, all the running backs are starters, so technically he's a starter. <laughs> it's like that, that year the Red Sox had five starters, but, like, they all had ERA like seven. <laughs> yeah, so. Five, eight, five aces is what it was. Five aces is what the Red Sox had that year. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, came in dead last. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you got? What do you guys got? I mean, the, the, the running back that – <laughs> that looks to me like would be the easy dynasty sell is if you can cash out on Zeke Elliott right now and get top dollar for him, I think you have to consider it. Um, Dan Dan has talked up Tony Pollard um, now for a couple of weeks. And um, I think if you have eyes and you just watch these games, it's clear who's the better back uh, and the more talented player. And I don't think Zeke will disappear. Uh, he's going to be the goal back. And he's gonna he's gonna be the early you know yardage back, um, but he's he's gonna get a lot of kind of empty calorie touches. I don't see him committing a lot of targets. I think Pollard's targets are gonna increase, um, and Pollard is the back who they get out into space. So even if it's a, uh, you know, a, I think it's gonna move towards like a sixty forty split, and I think those forty percent Pollard you know snaps are gonna be just as valuable. He's outscored him through two games, um, and people will kind of brush that off. But if he outscores him through six games, it's going to be like panic mode. Um, so I think if you're in a position that you can kind of move Zeke in Dynasty, I don't think it's the worst. Uh, the, it, you know, I'm not saying to sell low, but if you can get, you know, a like for like, um, you know, trade compensation, I would consider doing it. Um, and then the other player who's kind of a high profile guy who actually think looked great the first two games um, that might be at the peak of his Dynasty value is David Montgomery. Coop brought up Justin Fields and how he's going to treat David Montgomery. Um, I think some people might take an optimistic approach that it's going to be the best offense potentially that Montgomery's played in with a better quarterback play. Um, But I think the pessimistic approach would be, you know, this is a a better quarterback. He's going to look for those two receivers. Maybe Montgomery loses, you know, some of the value he has as a receiver. Um, And, based on the fact that it looks like it's almost kind of a correction in redraft where even the Montgomery doubters are saying I was wrong. He should have been drafted earlier this year. This might be the, the, the cash out, the, the maximum cash out time for Montgomery. I might look really stupid for saying Montgomery um, six weeks from now, but I think that um, you might want to test the market. Yeah. I mean, not, not just that, just real quick on Montgomery, but people forget that, you know, I know that he's had trouble with his recovery, but Tariq Cohen could come back. And Mm -hmm. when you look at the games with and without Tariq Cohen, you know, and they decided to extend Tariq Cohen. So he's now no longer just a carryover from the old regime. Now he is a current regime paid him guy. And you know, that if you combine, right, the mobile QB with the pass down back, that could be a guy that's getting one, two targets a game at most, you know? So I, I feel you on that. He does, Montgomery has passed the eye test though. I will say that. Because, hey, oh, he uh, looks, he looks great. Yeah, I mean, he, he looks, looks terrific. Good. But, but uh, Damian, I was like, Damian Harris looks really good running the ball, but mm-hmm. at the same time, the existence of James White caps his upside. We don't look at Damian Harris the way we look at David Montgomery because, you know, Damian Harris has the, you know, they both, you know, James White's there currently, but it could be a situation where they have their own James White in fantasy playoffs. And it's, you know, now you've got these two guys that look great running the ball, but they're not the full package that we thought, you know? Right. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and everything, the game scripts is have played right into Damian Harris's hands and still, you know, he's kind of a low end RB two. Um, catches. Yeah. He, he, and, uh, you know, a couple more. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out Chris Carson. Um, you know, he he fell into the end zone a couple times this last week, which which really helped him. Uh, he just, I don't know, he doesn't look great to me this year. He doesn't look, I guess, terrible, but he doesn't look great either. 
he's not getting as many targets, which is one thing that concerns me. He got three the first game. He didn't get any uh, in, in the game against Tennessee. And so I'm a little bit concerned about him. I mean, you know, we know that, uh, you know, that definitely they want to establish the run in, uh, in Seattle, but I'm a little bit concerned that, you know, like uh, Alex Collins or somebody like that could start working themselves into a little bit more of a role. Uh, you know, I don't think it's time to panic, but you know, if I could pivot off of Carson and get some pretty equivalent value, I'd probably be tempted to do that. And then, uh, you know, if you want, if you want me to go way out on a limb and uh, possibly have some real egg on my face, um, I'm not, sh- you know, Najee Harris is getting like a hundred percent of the snaps. He's getting a hundred percent of the work. He's, you know, he just looks like a, not a good fit for what that offense is doing right now. Uh, they don't have a good offensive line. He's not a very elusive guy. You know, he's used to having those Alabama holes, you know, that are, uh, you know, two barn doors wide to run through. And um, he just doesn't have that right now. And, you know, the offense really is struggling. I mean, they've put up, what, 17 points um, max so far this season. I mean, you know, I know it's a young season and all that. But, again, you know, I think he's somebody that, you know, you can find a lot of people who are still super, super high on Najee Harris. And if you've got a chance to move him um, and you can – you know, you can get a, a lot for him. That's something I would be tempted to do. You know, like if I could get, uh, you know, uh, an Austin Eckler, or if I could get DeAndre Swift plus for Najee Harris, you know, that would be something I would be very, very tempted to do. Yeah, I mean, you need that. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, Le'Veon Bell, and but in the zone blocking scheme. But that weight and then pick the whole kind of one cut thing only works when you have that line. The right. Line. The pounces are gone. Um, you know, uh, Villanueva went to the Ravens. The, who was and then the other one? The one of the guys is on the Chargers now. The guard. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, Reese. Uh, I'm blanking on who it is, but yeah. I, I'm missing the name too, but it's like the entire line's gone. It's an entirely new line. So yeah, I mean, it's just tough. Um, that's just a tough situation, man. So uh, I'm there with you. I mean, the, you love the usage, but that's a, such a good thing to sell right now. That, I think that's why you feel like you got egg on your face for saying that. But I mean, how easy is it to sell a guy that plays every single snap too? You know, like you could, if you can get an Eckler who's catching all those balls uh, or Swift who's Swift who apparently once, you know, the garbage time turns on. He's just 70 <laughs> yards, right? Like the last five minutes each game, the last two games, uh, you know, so I don't know. Uh, Theo, would you sell Najee if you could get, if you could get somebody second round type ish value? I mean, I, I have, I have so much Najee right now. It's, it's, it's a little scary. So when Dan, Dan said that, I, uh, I nearly threw up, but I think it's, it's just a, it's just a general, I, I think the, the, my takeaway is, um, in dynasty, sometimes selling at peak value is the is the correct move, even if it's a guy that's difficult to, to sell. I mean, you don't want to to piggyback on on injuries. But this past summer, you know, we we sold Cam Akers. Um, you know, Dan and JD and I discussed selling Cam Akers on a, on a Goat District pod, and, and uh, you know, I, I sold them a couple spots, um, which obviously worked out well. You know, I I could look very poorly right now based on how Darrell Henderson has done, but I think that. The general takeaway is selling at peak value, especially at a position like running back where, where the injury rates are high, is, is not the worst worst decision. And if Najee Harris disappoints this year, um, you know, and, and doesn't kind of pick up the production, you know, you could see him going lower in dynasty startups than he did this past summer towards the end of the summer. So I think Dan has a great point. Um, you know, if you can get max value on a guy – it's it's nothing wrong with with testing the waters, hmm. but yeah, I, I, I hope he's I hope he's wrong on that one. I will say <laughs> that's one that I, I, I think it, I think it all a big part of it is where you are in the cycle of dynasty, right? Because it's a kind of cyclical, right? Like I was telling people, you know, uh, DeAndre Swift is a guy that he's probably not at his peak value because this team is kind of in the tank part of a rebuild, right? And we watched the Rams, who Brad Hunt was Brad Hunt's the GM for the Lions. He was the uh, head scout for the Rams, they lost. They won only four games, and then the very next year they were they won the division. And it's like he came in, pulled the exact same tank that the Dolphins pulled to get Tua. You know, 
carry the most dead cap of any team, have the least active spending, let all your veterans leave, trade your quarterback, fire the coach, like exactly what the Dolphins did. The exact thing, right? With Tannehill and all those guys. And this team could turn around really quick. And if you're so if you're looking at Najee Harrison, you halfway through the year, they're kind of being like, okay, it's done and Big Ben's gone. If you're on one of those rebuilding teams, that's those are the kind of guys you want to maybe buy and store, you know? Mm-hmm. Whereas you're saying sell Zeke. If I'm on a team right now and I think that the only thing I need is an RB2 to win and people are trying to sell low on Zeke and they think he's at the cliff, then you can buy a guy who, even if they split carries, he's going to be an RB2. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah, I, no, absolutely. Cliff. Absolutely. Right. So it's like, it's all cyclical in this game. I'm, if I'm winning, if I'm trying to win right now, I'm buying the old guys. Give me Adam Thielen. You know what I mean? I'll take him. Yeah. If, if he's your only good player and you're trying to tank, you need to trade Adam Thielen, you know, and vice versa. It's like, uh, you know, you got to try and uh, catch these guys on the on the different slopes and match up with what you're doing. You know, uh, same with tight end by the by Gronk. If you want if you're trying to win right now and you got younger guys, if your best tight end is Friar Muth, you can't trust him this year. Keep Fryer Muth or trade Fryer Muth and get get a guy that'll help you win. You know, it's but that's dynasty. You know, it's uh you gotta play play to play to your teams and your goal. Yep. So yep. You exactly. All right, guys, let's get out of here with just a, a couple uh quick uh questions from our, our watchers or listeners. Um uh, first one, famous Jay. What what do you do about Jonathan Taylor? Uh, I'll I'll start on that. I mean, you know, it's I'm still playing him no matter what. Uh, you know, I don't I don't think he can sit him. Um, you know, with Easton at quarterback, whatever, I think uh, they're going to devise a game plan, which is probably going to, you know, it, and it very well could involve getting him some targets too. So, uh, you know, while my expectations are tempered, I'm, I'm certainly not sitting him. Uh, Coop, what do you think? I mean, again, it's such a small sample size, right? Like you have the best um, – I guess, I mean, now Brandon Brooks is hurt. It's kind of hard to say anybody is as good of a uh, run blocking guard as Quentin Nelson, right? But you put him up against Aaron Donald and you're not getting the benefit of that. You know what I mean? Like, so we got this small sample size of him going against the best player, maybe in the entire league, right? Uh, Let's see how it looks when he gets a kind of better matchup. And next week's probably not going to be that good of a matchup. Jeffrey Simmons and all these guys are, are animals of the Titans too. But he's going to have, I mean, on the schedule, they have the Texans, uh, twice, you know what I mean? Like they have the Jaguars are on there twice, right? Like, uh, you know, they're going to be plenty of games where Quentin Nelson is running over two guys, you know what I mean? And Jonathan Taylor is walking five yards before he even starts running, you know? So I think he's going to be fine. Jonathan Taylor himself needs, he's a guy that needs to get his pass blocking together or new Hines is going to keep eating snaps though. So if you're watching these games, uh, you know, and you just have Jonathan Taylor, you don't care about the rest of the team. Don't take your eyes off him. Watch his pass blocking because the better he does at that, the more he's going to play and the better he's going to be long term. You know. Yep, definitely. Yeah, I'm I'm playing Jonathan Taylor. I mean, you don't have a uh, uh, you don't have another back on on your bench that is going to e- equal his volume or even come close to it. Um, and you know he's it's the Titans. It's a, it's a, it's a divisional game. Um, I think they're going to lean on Taylor. They'll lean on Hines. Um, and it's, you know, they're going to do everything they can to make the game easy on Eason. And the easiest thing would be, you know, Taylor, you know, getting 20 plus rushes and being productive. So um, I, I, there's, there's no situation where I would be sitting Jonathan Taylor. Yep, for sure. Agreed. All right. One, uh, one last one. Uh, we, we sort of, danced around this one, I guess, a little bit, but um, who, who do we like uh, in place of Deontay Johnson in uh, Pittsburgh? So I did I did see this Instagram post. I, I saw it. Did you guys see it? It was I did not yeah, see it, no. About his, his comeback or something, his recovery. It was, it was very cryptic, and it didn't sound good. Yeah, it's like I literally warned people about these posts where it's like after somebody gets hurt, you can check their social media and – you know, a lot of times they're like, hey, I'm fine. You don't want to be back. Like Tyler Lockett, when he went to the hospital, was like, hey, I'm fine. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to mm-hmm. be, and he played next week, you know? But this one was one of those ones where he was like, hey, I'm going to come back stronger than ever. And that's like, I don't, yeah, they're no not good. usually talking about next week when they say that, right? Like, uh, so we will see about that. I think what ends up happening is, um, 
what we what we want to see, which is the highly consolidated snap share of Juju and Claypool, both of them just playing in every two wide receiver set, and James Washington coming in uh, sporadically. But um, you know, James Washington may be a DFS dart throw, but I think it just it, it rises. Uh, it, it'll be a big boost for Juju and Claypool, just making them a lot more trustworthy. For that. that's my thoughts on it. I mean, what do you would you guys go James Washington and anything or? I mean, we, I play NFFC and, and Dan does as well. Um, you know, it's a start three wide receiver and a flex and 20 man rosters. So I'm sure James Washington will be picked up in, in a lot of NFFC leagues, but I don't have much expectations for him. Um, for me, I think this is a, if you have Juju, you should, you should, um, we're not happy out of the injury, obviously, but you should feel very confident in, in the amount of work he's going to get. Claypool hasn't looked great to me. Um, you know, he should have come down with that, that touchdown catch last week. Um, and I, I think that, that Juju and, and Big Ben's going to lean on Juju. Um, I think he'll get a ton of targets. I think he's a, a, a an easy wide receiver, too, moving forward. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I, I think Juju is definitely the answer here. And, uh, you know, I, I'll probably throw some bids at James Washington, but I'm not going to break the bank for him or anything. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not that confident. And, you know, again, it kind of comes, comes back to that whole Steelers offense. I'm not super confident there's a ton of points coming out of there. So, uh, you know, that's why I'd rather stick with the more established guys if I'm, you know, that are probably already on my roster that rather than uh, trying to reach for, you know, a home run with uh, James Washington. All right, guys. Well, uh, we are, we are a, a buck 40 already. So, <laughs> it's easy to do it, man. It's easy to do yeah, it. Yeah. I feel like this we were was, just this was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. Guys. Absolutely. So, uh, Coop, let's, uh, let's uh, let you uh, give yourself any promos that you want to, anything uh, that you want to pop up, um, and, and let us know where we can find you on Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure, man. So I try and share as much stuff as I can on Twitter. Uh, at Coupe Fiasco, it was uh, on the screen there, but uh, yeah, C O P A F I A S C O. Um, find me on there. Ask me any questions. I do my best to answer all of it. A lot of our stuff at Fantasy Alarm. So pretty much all my articles are at Fantasy Alarm. Everything, all the really nerdy stuff that I write. I do a DFS article. I do uh, I'm doing snap count article. I do one article that's whatever I want every week. That was the, that was a deal I negotiated. I was like, they were like. You got to do three articles this year. I was like, okay, third one's whatever I feel like. And they were like, that's perfect, right? So, uh, and then I read, do a couple of videos. So that's, uh, some of that stuff's behind the paywall, but that's at Fantasy Alarm. And then, you know, you can catch me regularly with a couple podcasts that I do. The Fantasy Alarm podcast, that's free, Spotify, the Fantasy Besties, and the, um, with, that's with our buddies from um, the Scott Fishbowl League there, Dan. Uh, oh, yeah. And then um, the uh, lightning round with Kevin Tompkins and, and Scott Fishbowl winner Gary Haddo. Uh, that stuff's all linked to my profile though on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the 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 free one on Fantasy Alarm uh, that's that's really good. I, I caught your uh, pod last week, and uh, you know just a really nice week look at week two uh, going through, and uh, you know it was it was it was pretty quick. It was concise. It had a lot of good information. It's what I like. Uh, you know, and, and man, the best thing I can say about Coop is, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to put it this way, but man, I, I, I love using your research. You're doing all the grunt work for me. Uh, <laughs> that's why, that's why I do it, man. That's why I do it, brother. If you can, hey, if one person, if one person uses it and then every once in a while they say, you know, I got this from Coop over at fantasy alarm that that's what it's all for man i'm trying to help everybody out so i appreciate you 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 saying that and actually reading you know so thank you yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's great stuff and uh you know that's one of the reasons why we wanted to get you on here is because you know i'm like man it's it's criminal that uh you know i'm I'm using all this stuff and uh you know mining all that information and uh we we just got to get coop on here and uh and and give him a shout out talk about it a little bit and uh you know uh, it, quite, like I said, when I brought you on, I mean, you got more followers than me. So, you know, it's kind of funny me calling you an up and coming, uh, fantasy analyst, but, uh, you know, there, there's still a lot of people out there. It's a huge community. And, uh, the more people who can find out about you, the better for them, the better for you. So appreciate that, man, for sure. And I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm blasting this out to all my followers. So people can, people can see you guys and hear your stuff, man, because, you know, there's just, there's so much 
and I hate to say it, there's so much clickbait and there's so much junk out there, man. It's so good to get on here and talk to people that know what they're talking about, like-minded people, even if we disagree, right? Like we can have these conversations about Najee Harris. You guys disagree on Najee Harris? You know, yep. nobody's yelling at each other. Nobody's getting upset. It's like everyone's bringing facts. This is how we all get there. Iron sharpens iron. You know what I mean? That's what I always say with this. So, you know, yep. anytime, guys. I, and thank you very much for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. This is really, really, really a great show. I, I feel like it flew by. We're at a, we're at a buck forty four now, and uh, mm. I feel like you know we're at we're at like an hour. So this was this was awesome. I don't know if my girlfriend feels like it flew by. Let me let me check with her. After <laughs> there, you there you go. There you All go. There you go. We'll see. Yeah. All right, Theo. What you got on the way out? Uh, you can find my my work on Player Profiler. I do the the weekly waiver wire article. Um, and I have a couple other articles coming in there. And you can find me here every week on the GOAT District um, with Dan and JD and, and uh, working on some other potential, uh, you know, podcasts on the under the GOAT District umbrella that should be uh, dropping, you know, either next week or the following week. All right. I love Player Profiler, man. <laughs> yes. Appreciate I gotta that. Say, I'm not supposed to say it. I'm supposed to say I love Fantasy Alarm, but I love Player Profiler. That site's awesome, man. Especially for if you're a Dynasty player and you don't oh, use yeah. Player Profiler – Man, yep. you got to get that going, dude. Because that, that this, the, the articles over there are great. The databases, man, good, it's a good place, man. And Matt Kelly, you know, he's a little rough around the edges, but he's a funny dude, and he's a good dude. You know, he, he he's yeah. definitely, definitely, definitely a good guy, and and definitely a very, a very funny one in, in the fantasy so industry. And we've uh, we've had a few others uh, on from play, from Player Profiler. Josh Larkey's been on the show a number of times. Cody Mark Carpentier. So some some great great people over there as well. Appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Absolutely. Well, again, guys, if you enjoyed the podcast, please uh, make sure you get out there, smash that like, hit the subscribe button. Uh, you know, just let us know even, you know, just uh, a, a nice comment on Twitter, uh, slide into the DMs, let us know what you think. Uh, anything you'd like to see us do better, any guests you'd like us to have, anything like that. Uh, just pass along the feedback. We love it. And with that, we are going to get out of here and let you get back to your lives. You know the Pope listens Dynasty our religion For the blokes missing On all of these trades On all of these plays On all of these grades By the end of the day Y'all getting played So what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex Send the homie a text That trash off is the best You try to make it complex Then they text you back Now all of a sudden They don't make any sense <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy Trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's a... And I always be traded. And I always be traded. And I always be traded. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Fish.